Good morning, Gateway. Good morning, everybody in the courtyard right here in the chapel, in the youth center, everybody online visiting us. We're grateful that you're here this morning. Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. We're in this series called Chaos to Clarity. I've been a part of the church for a long time. We're going to be in chapter 12, by the way, which is spiritual gifts. And everybody said, ooh. Come on. Spiritual gifts. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, We want to look at what it looks like for us to operate out of these special gifts that God gives us. I remember being involved in a much similar ministry that you just saw on the screen uh, in in my early years of church life. I remember going to church for the first time as a 13-year-old and showing up in this place. I'd never been to church before. Walked in, and I saw the goofiest guy who happened to be my photography teacher, Mr. Smith. (laughs) Mr. Smith was a little too happy to see me at church and overly saved. You know what I'm saying? And it freaked me out. This guy was like... Like, like in my face, and uh, we have participated in this church. I'd never done anything like that, and there was some crazy stuff going on in this church. It was a Pentecostal church, so some of you Pentecostals know what I'm talking about. And for some strange reason, God was stirring inside of me something I didn't know at the time, but would lead me to this place. Amen. He would work in my heart in such a way. He would save me and then set me apart for a special purpose. I believe God wants to do that for every single person listening to me here and online, that God would set you apart for a special purpose. But one thing I know, the church is full of people. And people are full of, wait, I didn't say that, you said that. <laughs> people are full of problems, and we, we do. We have, there's a lot of fun in church life. There's a lot of amazing people, especially at this church at Gateway. Yeah. Listen, this church I've been to two times in my journey with Christ. I was here back in 2001, and I've come back since then, and God has restored in me a desire and a love for him and for his ministry. And for some of you, he wants to do that for you. This church has been that. Thank you to those who have welcomed me back with open arms over those years and loved me despite of me. You know what I'm talking about? Say amen if you know what I mean. Um, really, again, one of the things that will get in, in, in probably the, in the way of our achieving the mission that God has given us, which is to make disciples, is a thing called pride. It's uh, C.S. Lewis who says it's the granddaddy of all sins. Say it's the big one. It's the big one. Sin, sin. What's in the middle of sin? I is always in the middle of sin. It's called pride. Pride is the thing that gets in our way. It reminds me of a story about a uh, an officer in the military who became a colonel, and he was all excited about being a colonel. So he started saluting himself in the mirror at home, calling himself "Yes, Colonel. Yes, Colonel." He was quite full of himself. He was getting his office set up, and as he was setting up his office, there was a knock at the door, and uh, he thought, well, who is it? He says, well, it's Private Johnson here, sir, and he picks up the phone quickly and says, yes, Mr. President. Uh, Yes, Mr. President. Okay, Mr. President. I will get right on it, Mr. President. Click. Hangs up the phone. The private comes in. Come on in. What can I do for you? He's like, well, sir. He's like, I'm sorry I had to have this conversation with the president on the phone. Sorry to leave you waiting. He said, well, sir, the communications department just sent me over here to hook up your phone. <laughs> Pride will get in the way. Pride will get in the way. And it will, it will cause destruction in your life. For some of you, you know this. You know this. For some of you, you might think too highly of yourself, and we often forget the necessity of what we're going to talk about is spiritual gifts today, the dependency on God. Pride is the root of sin. Behind that are so many other sins. If you're not submitted to God, ultimately, it's because you think you are capable of making it through life without him. Uh, If you're the kind of person that doesn't pray or fellowship with God regularly, it's because deep down inside, you just don't feel desperate for God. If you're the kind of person that's not generous and not giving, it's because you assume that the one that's primarily responsible for your success is you. If you're not connected to the church, the body of Christ, you think that you possess everything you already need to make it in life. For those of you who frequent church on the weekends but never really get involved, it's a proud assumption that comes that you just don't need the grace of God deeply and intimately enough to work for him and serve for him in your life. Somebody say, oh, this pastor's going to, Teach the word, yes, but I'm going to tell it to you plainly. The church is God's plan A for the world. Yes, Jesus Christ died on the cross, but he's going to use the local body to reach the world. What is the mission 
of the church? Let me ask that question. What's the mission of the church? If you're having taking notes, it's in there, all right? Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, go and make... Disciples. Make what? Disciples. Disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. That's his promise. 2,000 years later, we're still here accomplishing the mission of Jesus. Go, baptize, teach. There are, those are all participles, by the way, in the original language. And they all relate to one controlling verb, make disciples, which means going and baptizing and teaching. They're only good as to reaching the goal, which is making disciples. Disciples. So we judge our success not by the number in our budget or the amount of people in the seats that come. We judge our success not by baptisms. We judge our success by making disciples. That's you going and making other disciples. Again, that's what we measure our success as a church, which means if God saved you, he saved you to send you. God saved you to send you. If you're taking notes, put that in your notes. God saved you to send you. You've heard it here before. Maybe you've heard it throughout your life in church life. God didn't save you to keep you on his sanctified shelf. That's not what he did. He saved you to send you into the world and be a blessing, to be a vessel that he works through. But there's a little thing called your will that often gets in the way. Some will say, I don't have the time. I'm just too busy. You have no idea what my family life is like. You have no idea what work life is like. I'm not that gifted. I, I, I just don't have the kind of motivation, Pastor Ron, that you've got. Besides, you're better at this. There's a Greek word for all of that. Malarkey. Okay, malarkey. <laughs> it's all about your will, your volition, your desire. Volunteer has to do with the will, volitionally. Pastor Ron, I don't have what it takes. Look at Acts 1.8. Jesus says this, but you will receive power, dunamos, dynamite power, when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. Jesus says in John 14, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing and they will do even greater things than me. Now, I know this. I know what I can do. It's limited. Somebody say amen. It's limited. That's right. Now, I've seen what some of you can do. Pretty amazing. But still, have you been able to cast out a demon yet lately? Have you been able to raise someone from the dead? Have you been able to make the lame walk or the blind see? Greater? Are we going to really do greater things? What is Jesus talking about? How is all that going to happen? Jesus says in John 16, But very truly I say to you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate, somebody say Holy Spirit. That's, that's a title. Will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him. Jesus had to go away in order to send the Holy Spirit. Jesus had to leave. So the Holy Spirit could come and do what? Greater things. The book of Acts records these greater things. Jesus continues to do the work that he started on earth through his vessel, the church. Say, that's me. That's me. That's the church. We see deliverance and miracles, and they're all awesome. But they will always pale in comparison to when the gospel is preached and sinners believe. When the spiritually dead come spiritually alive. These are the greater things that Jesus is talking about. You see, Jesus' miracles were only signs for us that pointed ultimately to the power of God, the power of God transforming the lives of people. And that's why at Gateway we are devoted to changing lives, transformed by the power of God. And this happens through the church. So the point I want you to see is that God equips you with the Holy Spirit for his mission. He equips you with the Holy Spirit for his mission. We are so clouded in our world today with a me-centered culture. Have you seen it? Many people today approach God like he's a genie in a bottle. And I'm not talking about the song, all right? It sounds something like this. God just wants me to be happy. And it seeps into the church. I hear it a lot. And happiness becomes the idol you follow after. We have a problem in our life. We ask Jesus to fix it. Problem is, Jesus doesn't just want to fix your problem. He wants to change you from the inside out. And we want to confine him to just fixing the problem. That's like having the plumber in your house, but he actually wants to be the landlord. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Listen, God is more concerned about your holiness than your happiness. We often approach God with a narcissistic point of view. We ask God, where do you fit into the story of my life? 
when we should be asking God another question, where do I fit into the greater story of your mission, Lord? God wants to give your life, listen, meaning and purpose, but here's the thing. It doesn't start with you. It starts with him, him at the center. He wants to give you reason, a reason for living that's greater than the pursuit of you and your agenda, greater than the pursuit of material possessions, that house, those finances, fame, beauty, strength, athleticism. He puts the spirit in you so that he could work through you, giving you purpose and mission. Look at 1 Corinthians 12.1. Now about the gifts of the spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. For so, some who like to study the Bible, you can look, but there's four, three other things that Paul talks about I don't want you to be uninformed about. One of them here is spiritual gifts. Now, Paul is saying now about. Remember that we're in Corinthians. Chaos was happening there, and God's going to give us some clarity through the gospel, and Paul's trying to point all this out. And they had given him a letter with five sets of questions. You remember, that's the context. These questions were coming to him. There are five sections that break apart in 1 Corinthians. You remember part one was the questions about divisions or schisms in the body, uh, chapters one through four. We covered that. Part two was questions about sex, singleness, marriage, divorce, remarriage. That was chapters five through seven. And then part three was navigating controversial topics, Meat offered to idols. Remember all that? Eight through 10. Part four, questions about church service, which is where we're at right now, chapters 11 through 14. And then part five, which we covered some on Easter morning, the resurrection, questions about resurrection, 15 and 16. This week and in two weeks, we're going to cover spiritual gifts. Chapter 14 was kind of the church gone wild, by the way, so be ready for that. In church life, we can expect a little controversy when it comes around spiritual gifts. Some of you know this in church life. I've been a part of church life for 41 years. <laughs> I am so old right now. But um, I love church. I love this church. I love it because we come from all different kinds of backgrounds and all different ty types of traditions. Some of you grew up in a Baptist church. Some of you grew up in a Presbyterian church or a Catholic church or a Lutheran church or Episcopalian church. Some of you are just part of Bible churches. Some of you are Pentecostals to the core. Some of you are charismatic. Some of you are just former addicts. I mean, we come from everything in the background Amen. here. And again, it, we are just a hodgepodge of people. Just say we're a hodgepodge. We don't have a label. We don't have labels anymore. We just kind of put those aside because we're pursuing Jesus. And the Bible tells us how to live this life in Christ. I was saved in a Pentecostal church. I went to a Quaker university. I pastored five churches, Pentecostal, Baptist, and non-denominational. How many people have that kind of hodgepodge background? Just raise your hand. Just nice and high. Come on. I know there's more of you out there. Just a hodgepodge. What does that mean? That means that we are predestined to speak in tongues at a potluck dinner. I know that, right? <laughs> It's given me, though, an appreciation, listen, an appreciation for how different traditions approach these questions. The words that just translated spiritual gifts, it's an unfortunate translation because pneumakaton, or that's, that's where we get pneumos, right, spiritual, it means spirituals, but it gets translated, probably not the best translation, spiritual gifts. It's, it's actually a more ambiguous word. It means basically like saying spiritual stuff. That's why I've given it this title, spiritual stuff. 1 Corinthians 12, 2. You know that, that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led and astray by mute idols. This is what was happening in 1 Corinthians as we read it. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Who empowers you to say that? It's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit always points to one person. What's his name? Jesus, when you're in church, that's the right answer every time, just so you know, all right? There are different kinds of gifts, charismatai, that's the word there in the Greek, gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, diakonai, which is where we get the word deacon, service, but, some, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, energema, which is where we get energies, but in them all, all of them, in every one, it is the same God at work. Somebody say the same God working, same God at work. Here's the principle. The Holy Spirit empowers you to reveal Jesus through supernatural gifts. Every believer is a given at least one supernatural spiritual gift. It's not your personality. That's your natural motivations. This is a supernatural motivation. It's not a talent or a skill. These are gifts given to the believer to do what? To build up the body of Christ, the church. 
all right? They come alive when you say yes to Jesus, and God can use these spiritual giftings. They reveal actually your place in the body. Look at verse 7. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for what? The common good, for the good of the body. That should always be your test when it comes to a spiritual gift. Is this helping the body? If it's not, maybe you should pause on that. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of? So he's going to go through a list here. We'll go through them quickly. I'll talk about them another time, not all of them today. To another knowledge by means of the same spirit. To another faith by the same spirit. To another gifts of healings by that one spirit. To another miraculous powers. To another prophecy. To another distinguishing between spirits. To another speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another interpretation of tongues. All these are at work. Um, all these are the work of the one and the same spirit, right? One and the same spirit works all of these things. And he distributes them each one as he determines. This is what you need to understand. You don't get to choose your gift. God gives them. He gives them to you. He determines them, right? He distributes them. Some of you are like weirded out right now. You're thinking we're going to pull out the, the snakes and stuff like that pretty soon. We're going to have banners flying. That's not our church, by the way. But it could happen. Anyway, let's go on. This is not supposed to be an exhaustive list, by the way, of spiritual gifts. Not an exhaustive list. There are, in fact, six different lists of spiritual gifts in the New Testament. Some of those basic passages are Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12 here, Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 4. 22 different gifts are mentioned there. No one list contains them all. Some believe there's over 100 spiritual gifts in the Bible. One of them is the gift of martyrdom. You use that gift like one time and you're done, right? <laughs> Another is the gift of celibacy. And every single guy said, I hope I don't have that. Anyway, so... You typically are given these gifts whenever God wants, listen, whenever God wants to use you to accomplish something in the world, that's when he gives you a gift. And sometimes it's in the moment. Sometimes it stays with you. Your gifts are your supernatural motivations. That's what you need to know. Your personality, the way you think, feel, and act is your natural motivation. We are to be supernatural people acting out of our supernatural gift. They are graces given by God. That's what the word means, gifts. Graces given by God. Sometimes they complement your personality, and sometimes they go right against your personality. That's why the person with the gift of mercy, who has a very strong personality and is a doer, director, makes decisions quickly, is very curt, can you know, chew somebody out at the same time, walk away, and cry about it. Anyway, that's the way it happens. Uh, your gifts are never to be worshipped, by the way. This gift you're seeing today, whether you see it as gift or not, of me actually giving, it's prophetic, teaching God's word, is whether you see it as a gift or not, it's not to be worshipped. This is just one of the gifts. There are so many things happening in the church right now this morning that had to happen for you to get here. If you're just a spectator, I encourage you to get a part of participating in the church. And just to encourage you, the Holy Spirit works. He shows up 59 times in the book of Acts, he shows up. And in 36 of those, he's speaking. We don't know exactly how, but just like in the early church, we are dependent on him to know our specific calling. That's why I'm mentioning this to you, that your gifts are given to you, first of all, understand this, by God, given to you by God, gifts from him. When you choose to follow Christ, you become a disciple. He dispenses these gifts in you. We've just read about it. They can't be earned. You can't swap them for another gift. You maybe wish you could, but Paul says here that the Holy Spirit distributes them and deposits them in you. And many times he gives you that gift for a moment. Your gifts are also designed to accomplish his mission, not your mission, his mission. Paul is teaching the early church and us today. Many of us have different gifts. Hallelujah. They're given by God with one purpose, to build up the body of Christ. Your gifts were made for service, not show. That's the point. The illustration that Paul uses over and over again is the body, the physical body. So listen up, verse 12. Just as the body, though one, has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ, for we all are baptized by what? One spirit, so as to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of lots of parts. We got body parts, right? That's, that's, you're our body part. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're part of it. You're part of it. Okay. Your gifts reveal, listen, you need to hear this. Your gifts reveal God's will for your life. For those of you who say you don't need church life, maybe you've come this morning, maybe you're watching on TV or through the internet somehow. Don't be surprised when you're struggling to hear God's voice or know his will for your life if you're not connected to the body of Christ. Because for the follower of Jesus, relationships in the body are key to knowing God. Using your gifts in the body 
in church is vital to, to knowing and doing God's will. God uses his gifts with God's people. For you to say on the outside, I don't need a church, and I've heard it a lot through my 41 years of church life. Friends of mine who walked away from the church and say, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't need the church. I'm going to say to you, listen, when you say no to the church, you're saying no to God's development plan and provision for you, literally his will for you in your life. You want to know God's power. You, 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 you want to know all of that. You want to have all that in your life. You want to know God's will. But when you're disconnected from the power source, which is God's church, and listen, I know this. Some of my deepest scars are from people in church, and they're painful. And some of you have been walking through those scars. But I want you to know the enemy's out to deceive you, to think you, you can do this life on your own. You cannot. You need the body of Christ I see this in church, especially a church like ours. People are what we call ninja Christians. They walk into church life, slip in the back when the songs are going just before the message. Before the last prayer, like a racehorse at the Kentucky Derby, they're gone. They're out the door. And again, ninjas are really cool. I think they are. But they don't make great disciples. You've got to experience church life. You're missing out on what God can do in the courtyard. And we've seen it happen here. You're missing out on what God could do in your life group. You're missing out on what God could do through the women's ministry and the men's ministry here at the church. It not just affects you, it affects all of us. Because listen, we cannot be us gateway without you involved. I don't know if you understand that, but when you step away from ministry, there's a loss. It's a big loss. You are a body part that's missing. If I want God to work in my life, I've got to be a part of the church. Disconnecting yourself from church, you're disconnecting yourself from God's power. Look at verse 15. This is what Paul is saying. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if an ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not be for that reason stop part, being part of the body. Verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, would that just be weird? Your whole body just one eyeball? Where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts, parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. God did it. If they were all one part, where would the body be? It would be weird, strange, lopsided. As it is, there are many parts but one body. No man or woman is an island. I know this. During COVID lockdown, some of you loved it. You could be alone. And that was great for about two weeks. And then you started smelling yourself. And you started smelling your thoughts, you know what I mean, by yourself. And you realized, oh, wow, this is not so good for me. We realize that as a culture, right? Have you ever seen the TV show Alone? Like those guys get down to eating bugs and talking weird stuff in their head because they're by themselves. It's not good. Self-reliance, independence, at some point, independence, at some point breaks down. And I know that's not American because we think we can do it all on our own independently. You think you're strong until you have a life-altering event. Do you remember when Dan Bowman broke his arm? Well, he did, and it was just hanging there, a, a, an arm that's dislocated. Imagine you saw out in the courtyard today, everybody, a, a person with a dislocated foot. They're probably in a cast. But to have a severed foot in the middle of the courtyard, you'd be like, ew, that's gross and really weird. What's it doing here? Some of you who are disconnected from the body of Christ, that's what you look like. That's you. <laughs> That's you, an amputated foot. That's disturbing, and it's just weird. So I know you'll argue that Jesus is all you need, but I can tell you from personal experience, you need more than just that. You need all that God has for you, and that's offered through his church. Some of you don't even see it because your depression and anxiety has clouded you. You're wrapped up in the lack of relationships in your life. You're longing to belong, and it goes deep into your psyche, and you don't even really understand it. But listen, God wants you to function in the whole body and be a part of, of Christ. That's why you're here. That's why he's drawing you here. You can't figure it out, but it's the Holy Spirit saying, you need this place. You need these people. Yes, they're messy people, but they're real people. Amen. And you need to be a part of the, the church. Listen, you will hear it from me. Everybody is somebody in his body. Everybody say that with me. Everybody is somebody in his body. 
We can't be us without you. Paul says there are many parts of the body. It's not on the screen, but verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot see to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker and indispensable. Do you have weaker parts in your body that are indispensable? Yes, you do. Pituitary gland. Do you know where that is? Most of you don't know. But it's really important, right? And all the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. Some parts you see, some parts you don't. I see this every morning in the tech ministry. There's stuff that you guys have no idea what's going on. They're working through all the bugs in the system just to get this happening this morning so that you watch online in the courtyard. We appreciate all those parts, don't you? I do. Without them, I have no megaphone. It doesn't happen. They're part of the ministry this morning. And so it's really important that we understand. Now, the tongue is a part of the body, right? Well, so is the foot. If my tongue were to say, well, I'm so amazing. Every morning I get to speak in front of gateway people and give them blessings that they just love. <laughs> and the toe, were, and the, the toe were to say, but that's not, that's not me. I'm just not gifted that way. And so uh, what happens when you get up in the middle of the night and all of a sudden you go around your bed and you hit that chest or dresser that's at the end of your bed with your toe? Immediately, like a homing beacon, curse words come to your mind. <laughs> And your little tiny peaky toe is just crying out for help. <laughs> and what are you saying underneath your breath? I'm no longer that beloved tongue. It gets affected by the stubbing of the toe. That's how the whole body works. You may think you're a toe. If you've ever struggled with the toe injury, you know how important the toe is. Amen. Your whole body works together. No one piece is invaluable. No one piece is unusable. Your gifts are designed to function in unison. This is the idea with the whole church. That's a big thing for Paul. All throughout his writings are spiritual gifts because your gift shows you the role that God has given you to play in ministry. If you have the gift of reaching others, awesome. If you have a gift of building up the church and serving and giving and encouragement and faith and hospitality, and all these insights and warning for people, to speak words of encouragement, let me be clear, having a spiritual gift is great, but we all need to be sharing Christ, evangelism, and serving, regardless of your gift. That's what we're called to. So here's the warning. Spiritual gifts can be divisive when they are misused and abused. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Chapter 14 will help us straighten some of these things out. People abusing gifts, elevating gifts, one gift over another, and some throw out the gifts altogether and say it's ended since the church age called cessationism. And that's kind of understandable given what's happened in some churches. But we're not to function like that. We are to function and we are not to ignore the gifts that God gives. We are to function in health and what it looks like in order as Paul will give us in 14. The church is not an audience. Listen, I know you think you are this morning, but we are actually an army. We are an army gifted by God to go reach the world. I'm praying that God will help you to see that you are the missionary in your home, at your workplace, in your neighborhood. You are the one, not me, you. You are the pastor in that life group. You are the pastor in that work group that you go to. You are the one who's bringing the gospel to people. The church was never meant to be limited to just one hour on Sunday where a bunch of people come together and the star, you know, the starstruck uh, worship team gets together and you get a superstar band and all that kind of stuff. Where they're really gifted and a communicator who's somewhat gifted. Anyways, that, that later gets, gets critiqued, right, in the car on the way home. That's usually what happens or on Instagram or Facebook or it gives me an email. It's always in there somewhere, the church is a body of people with diverse backgrounds and ideas, saved by grace, working together to achieve the mission that God has given. And Sunday morning is more than just Sunday morning. It's just part of that whole picture. It's just supposed to be a spark for you for the week. So don't just live on these words. You go to the Bible every day and ask the Holy Spirit to teach you. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you has a part in it. Say, each one has a part. Each one has a part. And God has placed in the church... First of all, and he goes, all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles and gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Rhetorical question. Are, and he says, are, are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Do all work miracles? No. Do all interpret or have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. Do you want to know what the greater gifts are? I don't have time. We'll talk about that in two weeks. <laughs> So your gifts are God's tools to be discovered, developed, and used. Do you want to have a starting place? You can go to www.spiritualgiftstest.com. 
All I encourage you, whenever you're taking an assessment, it's just an assessment. It doesn't mean wrong or right. But when you're doing that one, it goes from a scale of one to five. Don't choose three on every answer, by the way. It's either on one side of three or the other. And that, you could start there. But I can tell you this. You don't need some kind of assessment to tell you what your gifts are. What are you passionate about? What needs are you drawn to? What do others say that you're good at? I'm around a person here that makes me feel like a million bucks. I know this because he has the gift of encouragement. And I just feel like a better person being around him. You know those kind of people? Maybe you're one of them. Ask the people closest to you, what do you see my gifts are? Ask your spouse, do you see any spiritual gifts? Look at these lists that Paul gives. Maybe you can identify some of those. Listen, and develop them. The only way that you find out if you have a spiritual gift is actually get involved in ministry. I have to tell you, serve somewhere. So I'm dubbing everyone here, right here in the chapel. Vicky's going to love this. Everybody in, in the courtyard, everybody in the youth room. I mean, if you're online, just come and be a greeter. Everybody can greet. Can you say hello? Yes, you can. Even if it's in sign language, you could say hello. Okay, so there you go. You, you've got a, a first ministry right there to, to greet everyone. The question is, how do you move from spectator to participant? You know, our VBC is starting this summer, and I know this right now. Miss Amy needs VBC counselors, adult leaders and junior leaders, go see her, email her, amy at gatewaybible.org, and say you want to volunteer, even if it means putting out food for the week or just helping. I know she'll need a nurse and those kinds of things. We need ushers and greeters and life group leaders and tech people and worship people and people who will work with our youth, just like you saw on the screen. What a blessing that is, people to work in the office to help us just get things done every week. That's just inside the church, but let me remind you that most of these things in the early church, the ministries happened outside the church. Of the 40 miracles that were were happening in the early church, 39 of them were outside the church. So use your gifts, not just in the church, but outside the church. How do I do that? Where do I really do that? How do I get connected with people? First of all, get involved in a life group. Get involved in Kristen's um, Bible study ladies. And men, get involved in what Pastor Dan's doing for the men on their studies on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then be involved in what we're trying to promote here every week. That's why we do this for you. Get involved. Again, the problem with all of this is that we can easily fall into what 1 Corinthians in the Corinthian church and the church in Rome, also Rome, was was happening. Is that we, we take pride in our gift. And here's the thing. What happens for us is that we need to understand the gospel correctly so that we don't take pride in things that didn't come from us. That gift didn't come from you. It came from the power of God. So start with the gospel. What does the gospel teach you about you? It teaches you that you were so needy and helpless that you needed God to save you entirely through an act of his grace, nothing of your merit, and by his power. And that should permanently, by the way, destroy any sense of self-sufficiency or pride at all. And you go on to trust God with that same dependency as he sustained you in your walk with him. So don't think too highly of yourself. And then don't think too lowly of yourself. God has gifted you. It's a good balance between the two. He has given you gifts to to work in the church and to bless others in the church. So allow him to use you and you be humbly his vessel in the church. This is why today we're going to end the service here with communion. We come back to what Jesus did for us on the cross, the great sacrifice to make us available for him to use us. We celebrate here an open table. What that means is if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you've repented from your sin, you've asked him to be Lord of your life, and you're following him, this table is for you. If you have not yet done that, we just ask for now. Until you make that decision, let this pass you by. Paul talks about not eating in an unworthy manner. So as our team comes up, I want to give you some direction on how we're going to do this this morning. First of all, if you've never said yes to the most important gift, Jesus paid for your sins. In my place, he died. You can do that today. I know some people did that last week. Amazing. You can say, Jesus, be Lord of my life. I confess you as Savior. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and make me brand new. And if you're looking for a place to serve, just let us know on that yellow card. I want to serve somewhere. Maybe you click off somewhere, some of those things that you could do in your gifting. Maybe you don't know your gift yet. You find that out. Get involved into a life group. But let's stand to our feet. And as we come forward in this song to get the elements, come forward on the outsides and back to your seats on the inside aisle. Let me pray. Father, we give you these moments, Lord. We know 
the importance of what you've done on the cross, Jesus, for us. And we recognize that it's only by your grace that we can be here today. Remind us, humble us, and use us in Jesus' name.